I said, hear, he, hear me out, okay? All I'm saying is, has anybody even seen the great turtle? What if we don't live on a disc, but instead we live on a globe? Have you ever thought of that? Where's the proof that it's really a disc? Why not a globe? You're crazy, man. <laughs> How could it possibly be a globe? You can't even see p things drop off the edge. <laughs> and because, with that, welcome to because the show. There would be no. <laughs> All right, we'll stop that. <laughs> Let's not get into a reverse flat earth here. But so with that, welcome to this week's episode of the 800s. I am your humble co host, Alex, and you just heard from my fellow. Uh, round earther co-host adam <laughs> and the thanks as always to alan in the back making it happen captain <laughs> and with that why don't we quick dive into our plugs yeah sure thing you joined us for our uh brief before the show you heard some music that was fearless first by incompetech you should check out all the offerings they have uh, by going to incompetech.filmmusic.io. Uh, Filmmusic.io is a great place for artists to share their creations. And uh, it's, a, it's a place that we find a lot of inspiration for our own projects. So you should check it out. If you'd like to know more about us, you should check out dmstable.com. On dmstable.com, you'll find a whole bunch of things, such as our Audible affiliation uh, dmstable.com slash audible is the link for a free uh, one month subscription of audible to get your toes wet in the world of audiobooks so if you're interested in broadening your senses when reading go ahead and check that out also we have a youtube channel that you should check out uh, the link is below your video uh, we are the dms table on youtube as well and we post most of our videos there for your viewing pleasure. Uh, we uh, primarily pay the bills two different ways. We have Patreon, uh, DM's table on Patreon. Link is below the video as well. And uh, Etsy, dmstable.com slash Etsy. If you'd like a cool, nerdy, little 3D printed project thing, for yourself or maybe some nerdy digital art or uh you know other stuff you should check out our etsy page and see what uh what might pique your interest uh, i won't give away too many spoilers you just have to go over there and see for yourself what's uh what's available <laughs> and uh finally if you'd like to reach out and talk to us on our socials we have facebook and x on Facebook, we're at the DMs table, and on X, we're at DMs table. Uh, so check that out if you'd like to give us a follow and stay up to date on all the ongoings of the DMs table. And of course, if you're uh, super impressed with everything that we do, you should uh, request a link to our Discord uh, server where we talk about all things nerdy, not just books, but uh, D and D and 3D printing and uh recent shows the whole whole shebang so if you're interested hit us up on our socials and we'll get you that link otherwise i think that's uh pretty much it for the plugs alex why don't you tell us what we're reviewing tonight all right this week on the 800s or this month uh we will be discussing the color of magic by sir terry pratchett first of the Discworld series Sir Terry takes us to the far ends of the improbability curve of the multiverse to a world of magic, placed soundly on the back of four elephants perched atop the shell of the great world turtle Artuan. We follow Rincewind, a not-quite wizard who only knows one spell he can't use, and he is, plays tour guide for two flowers, a naive in sewer ants agent from the great Agatean <laughs> Empire. <laughs> Hounded by the Discworld's god of fate and death itself, Rincewind and Two Flowers take off on a serial series of wild and zany adventures, all beneath the octarine sky, which only wizards and cats can see, for it is the color of magic. <laughs> in, in sewer ants really got me there. <laughs> <laughs> that's, def that's definitely a, uh, a little 
um, what do you call it? Easter egg for the audiobook listeners there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if this is your first time joining the show, I'll give you a quick rundown of how things work here. Uh, we are a discussion channel. So the best way to make our show interesting is to participate. At any time, if you have anything that you would like to discuss about the book, feel free to throw it up in chat. Uh, Alex and myself will uh, pay attention for any sort of topics that chat wants to discuss and we'll throw it out there for everyone to pitch in with their own ideas. Uh, while you guys are formulating your own ideas and typing them up, Alex and I will discuss what we think about the topic at hand and then we'll give shout outs to anyone who responded on topic. Uh, so if you're interested in participating, feel free to throw up your a uh, little snippet, a little your opinion, your your topic at any time in chat. Uh, that's that's pretty much that's pretty much the whole whole show there. <laughs> just chit chat. <laughs> yeah, and just a reminder, our chit chat does happen to be about some adult topics, content, and a little swearing here and there. So bring kids around at your own discretion. For this is a show for adults mostly. Uh, also, we're trying to create a fun and supportive atmosphere over at DM's table where people can feel free to share in all of the things that make them happy, passionate, and geek out without any fear of teasing, reprisal, or judgment of any kind. So, in sum, be nice or fuck off. <laughs> Never, never a subtle fuck off. Just a, just a right hit just you in the need face. Just drive it in. <laughs> <laughs> we do not tolerate All intolerance. Right. <laughs> <laughs> With that, let's dive into the convo. Uh, Alex and Chat, what were your initial thoughts of the color of magic? So, uh, this one I ended up. Once again, reading both the physical book and the audio book because it was f fairly short, despite the fact that we're back to like a two week format for a short period of time. Um, uh, I found the introduction to be like that. It, it, it did a very good job of kind of giving you the tone for what the whole book was going to be like. It was at confusing fascinating uh weird and funny all at once in just this like short amount of time like uh honestly arguably best joke of the whole book was what the big bang theory really was about um <laughs> 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 but i thought it did a really good job of kind of setting the tone both for like the type of world that was being built uh the types of characters you'd likely see the type of prose that the author was going to use and it was fairly consistent to that throughout the book and so I, my first impressions were this is going to be fun i'm going to have to pay attention because the names are weird and some of the like visualizations of things were going to be kind of difficult to just pull together it didn't just like immediately click into place because by its very nature the world it's describing is meant to be an entirely upended version of our own, you know? <laughs> so yeah. like I knew I'd have to pay a bit of attention to like get through it, but I figured it would be worthwhile based on what I was reading from the beginning. How about you? You know, right from the get go, uh, I think this book gives off strong Tolkien vibes uh, in, in tone of voice and atmosphere. Um, I I was a little concerned that I was in in for more than I could chew <laughs> if it if it followed in Tolkien's footsteps. Uh, but I think Pratchett uh, early on set his own tone and uh, really really made himself stand out in the crowd. <laughs> he he definitely took a far more humorous route than what Tolkien takes with with his novels. <laughs> um, but but I feel like the world building was there too, where it's just like 
you know, I've I've got my idea of how this world works, and God damn it, I'm shoving it down your throat. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was I was impressed and was eager to get the ball rolling and see where he was going to take it. Uh, looks like B.S. Drake said uh, the time jump cuts were confusing, but this is a very familiar tone to Hitchhikers and love the high fantasy feel. I think uh, B.S. Drake brings up a good point is that this did have kind of like a mix between Tolkien and Hitchhiker's Guide, kind of a balanced feel for like the weirdness versus like that high fantasy and the names that you would see. Uh so I think that's a good way to describe it between like your two descriptions via Drake and Adam is like it hit that tone and made it distinct for Terry Pratchett. And it was attention grabbing to be sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, considering we've already kind of touched on world building, let's, let's make that a topic. Mm -hmm. uh, what did you think of the world that Pratchett built? And uh, what do you think? What do you think his world, or what do you think stood out most about his world building? I thought it was considering how weird the world was that was being built. It was interesting to see how purposeful the impracticality and improbability of everything was. You know. Uh, <laughs> Like, he spends, what, probably about, uh, in audiobook terms, about a half hour describing just, like, the directions of the turtle shell and the stars and everything. Yeah. <laughs> and, the, and, like, the spin of it. And, like, building a world that is meant to be different than, like, you can't, like, you can't apply the same physics structures or visual structures that you can in his world as you do to most not just like our world but most fantasy worlds generally speaking follow that we're on a globe and, or we're on a part of a map where it doesn't matter where these things are or if it does matter it's more astrological than astronomical and Terry Pratchett did a good job of like creating a world that was incredibly complicated but if you sat down and like i i actually did this when i was like listening to the audiobook because i did that after i read the physical book i sat down and as i was listening to it i was like kind of drawing out what i was hearing and it comes out to make sense <laughs> like like, so you created something complicated that if you sit down to take time with it, you can form a visual in your head, which he's doing with a world that operates under essentially the same physics, but a different perception of them. And, you know, if you exclude the whole eighth color or the four plus four color. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can't believe you just said that live, nonetheless. <laughs> but yeah, I thought it was a pretty pretty interesting how he created this world that has both like this a astronomical aspect to it, but also the societies within the world also make sense considering how this world is built. It's a lot more likely that some people are going to have access to a lot of stuff that other people aren't. Getting to people who aren't on the main part of the disc. Versus the ones who are in, throughout, like, the easier to access parts makes sense. Um, the fact that there's a whole society built around, tip, uh, like, looking over the edge plays to human curiosity, but, like, that only exists if you have an edge of the world to begin with, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I thought it was kind yeah. of fun that way. You know, what I what I most enjoyed about the world and the setting that Pratchett built for the color magic is that every time they moved somewhere else, it was like, you know what? Fuck the previous rules. This place has new rules. <laughs> <laughs> 
and it really it really helped make each setting feel unique and uh you know like each part of the book each like he kind of talked about uh how each section of the color of magic is like its own book mm -hmm. or its own story and they just happen to be piled together into a single novel and you really get that feel because it's like the place with dragons is absolutely nothing like the, whatever the city is that you start out in that ends up getting burned to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I believe and, uh, more pork. It's more pork. I remember that. I was just like, I want. I yeah. almost said more chicken. <laughs> <laughs> um. You know, it really, it really felt like Pratchett had ideas about what a fantasy setting could be, and instead of being like, "I'm gonna pick one and then I'm gonna write a novel in that setting," he was like, "No, nah, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna pick whatever I want, and <laughs> we'll roll with it from book to book here." <laughs> yeah, and um, yeah. I think you, I think you bring up a good point about like the sectioning of like the areas that you're in. But the thing is, is like he created and for world building purposes, he created a world where it makes sense for different sections to be very different. If you think about it as being a world like a world that is subject to eight seasons, that is subject to like all kinds of things our world never would. And the fact that it is effectively a part of multiple living organisms, it makes kind of a weird sense that it is more likely to have these more wild shifts between different sections of the world, right? So, and especially when you add the magic on top of it, which sounds like uh, V.S. Drake, that was part of their favorite part of the world building was there being more to the metaphorical iceberg of the world and the magic makes it that much more enjoyable is that, yeah, you get this like weird look at a disc on top of elephants on top of a turtle. But then when you really sink into it, there's so much more to it. And it's fun discovering those little bits and getting to have effectively four separate adventures along the way. <laughs> yeah. Boring, do you think it is for those elephants? Though, like, I don't think they can really move. <laughs> Just gonna stand there all day. Oh man, what are you gonna do today? I don't know. I'm gonna look over there. What are you gonna do? Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play with my trunk. <laughs> yeah, it's like shit. <laughs> hey, did you notice there's a disc on top of us? Like, fuck, man, how long's that been there? <laughs> I have to imagine one of the many Discworld books covers that in some aspect because, like, yeah. how do you get elephants to just stand there for effectively eternity? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, does one of them have to poop at some point? <laughs> like, how does that work? <laughs> That's where all the water comes from. <laughs> or is it like, or is it like the salamanders where they evolve differently? You know, like the salamanders in that world have no mouths because they absorb light through their skin and they have no need of mouths which again goes into the the weird detail in this like that iceberg that vs drake was talking about in the world building is it makes sense you're a magical creature you absorb magic and light you poop light you're a flash bulb <laughs> photosynthesizing elephants on top of a turtle in space yes <laughs> That's probably it. <laughs> Fias Drake uh, had a hard time with the parts of the book where you really had to pay attention. I'd say, yeah, there were a lot of uh, big details that were only mentioned one time. Uh, you know, so, some stuff was repeatedly hit over and over, like not saying eight in, in the lair of... Um, what was that thing's name? Uh, Bell Shamharoth. Bell Shamharoth. Yeah. But yeah, there's definitely definitely a lot going on. And it's it's definitely a book that I would say is worth taking the time to pay attention to every 
every little bit. Yep, I would agree. Uh, and one of the things that makes it worth taking that time is, I think, the fact that you do get those little nuggets of reference that you might not otherwise that have some pretty good payoff. So um, let's make that an, a new question then was uh, what running gag you think had the best payoff as far as like it doesn't necessarily need to be a gag but like what running theme or element of the story do you think had the best payoff um i would i would say the best the best part that was kind of kind of a, a joke was that rinse wind is a wizard but he can't cast magic because like he obviously introduces himself to everyone he comes across as a wizard and like he's got like the membership card, so like he gets in the exclusive club. He can see Octarine. Uh, Death has to be the one who claims him, <laughs> but like he can't do fucking magic. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, you took my favorite one, and actually, it partially became my favorite when I was looking through this, and I realized that like this magic system felt familiar. So I looked it up, and apparently this magic system um, is based on the same magic system that eventually inspired the magic system for D&D. &D. And effectively, what happened is uh, Rincewind is a first-level wizard that somehow gained the ability to use a ninth-level spell... And it's taking up all his spell slots. <laughs> 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 but he can't use it because he might unleash the end of the universe. <laughs> he's he's a first level <laughs> wizard who prepared spells, but the only prepared spells he he knows are ninth level. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, it's old D and D rules where like you have <laughs> like where the spells effective it's what got me was the spells disappearing part. Right. And it's not yeah. like spell slots are one of those things that we know of in D&D &D 5e that are like a part that they effectively brought back uh, from like the original in a way that made more sense. But in like the original D&D, &D, like you had to prepare your spells every day, essentially. And then when you used them, they were gone. You had to like be able to pull them back out again, essentially. Uh, <laughs> through like having like a book of magic or something and so yeah this is basically a guy who only knows one super powerful spell that he's too afraid to use <laughs> 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 so he's a wizard he just <laughs> is like boned <laughs> oh, magically I really i really i really thought that we were going to get to see his mega spell by the end but Obviously, he did not end up casting it. No, but we hear it <laughs> a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> I do actually kind of like that idea, uh, but we'll get more into that because I want to talk about the magic system itself separately. Um, uh, this book is on the DM rule page in the player's handbook. I don't, is it actually V.S. Drake, like, in the Player's Handbook, or is that a joke that, like, because I literally was just reading the Player's Handbook this week, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll open it up. Hang on. <laughs> All right. Um, so, just so that we touch on something else as far as, like, running gags, um, I really did like the payoff of uh fate at the end getting just fate and death uh basically just getting bamboozled by this wizard 
uh, throughout yeah. the series and like the running bits that came with that about how they became sacrifices because fate was like you can't cheat me so I'm gonna cheat you <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah. they get and then they get into this argument, fate and death get into this argument about like what's more inevitable, fate or death. <laughs> I thought yeah. that was kind of funny. <laughs> like, fate and death haven't like death is just like yeah, it comes to everybody. So like I just have to wait. <laughs> and then <laughs> and to top it all off, at the very end when death is supposed to come for Rincewind, it's like some minor disease that shouldn't even kill you. <laughs> You know, because Death's busy walking the streets of a plague. <laughs> he was essentially like, fuck you, he's not going to die. Fool me once, you know. <laughs> not going to walk yeah. all the way out there just for him <laughs> to not die again. <laughs> he's in the wrong place this time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Appendix oh, like... E is inspirational reading. Uh, it's a big list oh, okay. of books books for inspiration and pratchett is indeed on there uh, ah, color okay. of magic and the rest of the discworld series uh that makes sense because i didn't get into the inspirational reading part when i was le- reading the player's handbook i read yeah i should have known with appendix e i know i read the first few appendices but uh yeah it makes sense that he would be because you know that definitely applies so then since we're into this anyway why don't we talk about the magic system yeah i think i think it seemed pretty straightforward except for when it wasn't (laughs) (laughs) no obviously at the beginning you're like "Ooh, rincewind's a a wizard i wonder what he can do and then turns out nothing but um (laughs) you know exist and be somewhat intelligent and not a dumbass about stuff (laughs) which sometimes seems pretty magical if you ask me (laughs) (laughs) um i i really liked how uh rinse how rinse when worded it where he was like uh Magic isn't really a shortcut. You've got to put just as much effort into preparing a spell as it is to actually do the thing that the spell's going to do. Uh, it really, kind of, in my mind, kind of levels out what magic is to the the disc world. You know, it, it's a conven a, a matter of convenience for timing, and not necessarily a matter of being able to be a god upon the planet. You know. Yeah, and I think that uh, B.S. Drake hit the nose on the head by saying that it's intelligently loose in that for most people that is the case, but then you encounter beings like the demons or the homunculi that can uh, do this extra stuff because they have a different means of accessing the magic and that there is this world, uh, there's a time when the world and magic had a different relationship to one one another but the gods decided that was too noisy. <laughs> <laughs> like they just made a mess. <laughs> and so it got confined. And the confining was doing exactly that and making it so that there's an equal equal, equal and opposite reaction type of thing, which I also found phenomenally funny is this idea that Rincewind is a wizard that has this ultimate magic, can't use it, and yet he is seeking something more ordered and, like, that, you know, you could just, like, count on, you know, do some numbers and, like, know exactly what you're getting out of it instead of this, like, guessing game and that, like, consistently binds the universe together and he's just describing math and science. (laughs) 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 And Yeah, pretty much. Pratchett does a good job of, like, taking magic and science and kind of fusing them together, again, with, like, the picture box, which is just a demon that, like, does sketches of something and and needs better lighting sometimes, so you use salamanders that shit light, and, um, because it doesn't mix with the actor. (laughs) I gotta say, about, about the camera, I... 
I thought at the very beginning it was like, oh, this is a piece of technology that these people just don't have yet. And Two Flowers people totally have advanced technology and they can take pictures because that's a thing. And then somebody asked, like, what the fuck is that? And Rincewind's like, ugh, another ignorant local. Let me just dumb it down for you and say something that you'll totally believe. And he's all like, there's a demon in there that takes a picture and fucking draws it and stuff. And then <laughs> how does the camera end up working? Oh, there's a demon in there that draws a fucking picture. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, and... I think that is part of what plays into what V.S. Drake said about it being amorphous enough to be up to anything, uh, like open to anything, is that some things, it very much sounds like a, an advanced culture being like, how do I make this like digestible for the yokels? Uh, because <laughs> that is the character that Two Flowers plays, is the the advanced tourist in a foreign land type of in a less developed foreign land and that's how you i believe there's actually evidence that like there were times where we've taken like well i mean if you look at like the history of colonization essentially people have brought technology like brought technology that the locals didn't understand and they're like it shoots fire it must be magic nope it's gunpowder but we can tell them it's magic but in this case, it's yeah. just fucking magic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly that. <laughs> yeah, and uh, uh, let's talk about let's talk about Two Flower. Um, what did you think of Two Flower uh, in terms of his uh, like how unique his character was, and where do you think he stood out? Um, I thought it was a unique, it was like an interesting reversal of what we typically see, because we're typically on the side of the more advanced going to the less advanced when we're in a lot of these scenarios, at least in a fantasy setting. It's more, it plays more sci-fi than fantasy in that way, right? Yeah. And that blending of sci-fi and fantasy is a theme we see throughout this book, and I thought he was, he he was naive enough to play as the curiosity of the reader and give a vehicle for like asking the questions that somebody that is as disinterested as Rincewind um, would never ask and pushing the story along out of pure curiosity for somebody who literally at the end of the book describes himself as being uh, preferring boredom over action. Um, like, yeah. So I think Two Flowers was a fun vehicle for the fun in this book. Um, a good foil to Rincewind, the other main character, and a bit annoying sometimes, but I think that's intentional. <laughs> like, because he's supposed <laughs> to be that, like, that ignorant tourist or whatever. I did enjoy some of the running gags with him as well. Like again, uh, from my open, uh, from my opener, the it, what describing what into sewer ants is, <laughs> and it's basically <laughs> just making a bet that your stuff will make it will survive <laughs> or not, and that's what insurance is. It's, it's just gambling essentially. <laughs> I would describe it as. Oh yeah, okay. Never mind. It's, it's definitely <laughs> it's definitely reductive. There's more to it than that, but I like but the reductive <laughs> nature of its description was funny to me. And him bringing thought, these modern concepts into a very old-timey fantasy world was fun too. I thought it was pretty funny that uh he sold insurance to some guys for their their business burning down <laughs> right before the entire city burns down. <laughs> like, oh yeah. And then he's just all casual about it. He's like, oh yeah, okay, yeah. I guess the, I guess I'll have to pay out on their claim then, because 
the, the city burned down. Yep, that's insurance for you. <laughs> <laughs> Standard 200 gold valuation. <laughs> <laughs> That was pretty uh, great. V.S. Drake, uh, ba- uh, kind of on that note, V.S. Drake says that they liked uh, how they were throwing gold around and causing, you know, their they're throwing gold around effectively causes the destruction of this town. Uh, one of the things that is heavily hinted is that the color of magic kind of follows and this is a bit of an older tuner phrase, but it's called the like the color of money. And we see the power of money in this world to burn down an entire city just because it gets casually <laughs> thrown around. And it somehow is more powerful than all of the magic that seems to run through this town at any given time. <laughs> so, yeah, that was that was uh that was pretty good how he just shows up and he's got essentially like a travel guide book with common phrases to say. <laughs> <laughs> he just fucking says every single one every time. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know, like I would like a inn or whatever the fuck else he says. Hotel, motel, <laughs> lodging, <laughs> lodging, tavern or bar. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to bring you to all of those? Uh, I'm looking for an inn, hotel, motel, tavern, bar, place for sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's very that was a pretty bo- good guy. Yeah, he has uh, he's the definition of like has like having knowledge but not wisdom you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> he's got all this access to like all this knowledge and technology and just us outside of in sewerance is dumb <laughs> like naively yeah. dumb i think i think where two flowers stands out the most is the uh the dragon place where he manages to summon not only a dragon, but like the most dragony dragon of the dragons. <laughs> <laughs> so dragony that the undead king of the place wants him to take over for him because he's the only one who's made dragons as dragony as his dragons. <laughs> <laughs> and then he fucks it up by saying, Hey, I wonder if dragons can go to the moon. <laughs> <laughs> After two things being explicitly told that one, the farther you get from this place, the more they disappear. Yeah. <laughs> um, and two, having already seen that, like, he knows, I don't think he knows the physics of like going into space knocks you out, but like, he already knows that it gets colder and colder. And eventually, if you fall asleep or something, the dragon's going to (laughs) disappear. And so he just ignores that. It's just like, let's go for it, baby. (laughs) (laughs) I did think that was an interesting twist where it's like. Dragons aren't real. Dragons are definitely not real. And then they get to a place with dragons and they're like, what the fuck? I thought dragons weren't real. And they're like. Yeah, no, they're not. They're imaginary. (laughs) (laughs) They're like, oh, okay. (laughs) Well, it looks like B.S. Drake has a question for you, so I will pose it. Uh, I think this book lacked, if it lacked some of the comedy, Adam would have hated it. How close is B.S. Drake on that note? I'm assuming because the plot was kind of ambling. Based on my desire for plot. uh, You know, it's, it's hard. It's that's a fair question. It's hard to really determine if if it lacked humor, if I would have been like, this book sucks, there's no point to this book. I think it does have a semi plot to it because you know the the purpose is to keep two flower alive. The plot is you know, survive traveling. <laughs> So you um, like the fact that it had stakes at the very least. Yeah. 
and that's it wasn't, what it wasn't just they, they're alive in a place it was they're trying to stay alive and see all the places <laughs> Yeah, so the yeah, so the plot is to see it all while keeping this guy alive. So there's stakes and something outside of the characters that keeps things moving. And yeah. that's effective, uh, you know, and that takes the place of plot, which makes sense. Yeah, but it's hard to separate this book from the humor because it's so like integral to it. Um speaking of which, uh one of the things that we talked we've touched on a little bit um uh so i got distracted by vs drake saying it was the detailing of an adventure took me a second to fully understand what they meant it does feel kind of like a diary of an adventure almost um (laughs) but uh one of the things i wanted to talk about is like this book is very clearly a parody of like all things fantasy as of like circa 1983 so we're talking (laughs) like brushed uh, like airbrushed pictures of barbarians and such on the side of vans level of fantasy all the way back to like original like you know like you said uh token so like what were some of your favorite references to high fantasy that they like parody references Oh man, I don't think I could pick them out. <laughs> like, what I'm, are some I'm of the terrible at picking out references. I'm I am i could not tell you, man. I I'm terrible at references. <laughs> that is that is not in my forte of <laughs> picking out references to other works. Um, you know, well I'm, then maybe we I'm can be able uh, to say something I like, but. <laughs> Uh, but, well, I'll you know. share a few that I caught then, and you'll tell me if like uh, these were ones that you found amusing or your thoughts on those things. Uh, we'll start off in the dragon world, which was like going. We're talking about the fantasy art, like the fantasy art. The descriptions of all of the dragon riders, in particular, uh, I forget her name, the princess. The, uh, the drag, the one who was never supposed to inherit it. Uh, um, what's her is name? Is that Liana? Yeah, uh, like her description is like the fantasy description of women, and I loved it. Like how she was like, she basically has everything that all of the other dragon riders have, except like her armor covers nothing but her boobs and her calves <laughs> <laughs> and her and uh you know and Hrun uh Hrun the barbarian is just a loincloth like and he has a sentient sword which is very clearly a reference to Conan the barbarian <laughs> you know like <laughs> like the those sorts of characters I thought were kind of funny especially because you know obviously the female character has to be way smarter than the male character and is okay with just like playing in the background while also having to assert her dominance over the world that rejects her, but does it in the most ridiculous way possible in the skimpiest outfit, yet is the most badass character, which I found amusing. Um, another one uh, that I, I I thought you might get this one uh, was Bel Shemharoth is a uh, and his temple is very clearly a reference to uh, Lovecraftian types of monsters. These old gods that exist outside of the regular gods that are essentially like world ending. So they had to be tucked away, away from everything else because they're neither good nor evil. They're just pure chaos. And um, yeah, the Eldritch horror uh, thing that VS Jake just brought up, uh, because the description of the tomb sounded so much like the description of uh, when we read the short stories in our second ever episode. Well, actually, technically in our pilot episode. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, it sounded very similar to that cavern on the island, that like that description of what it felt like to be in there, the echoes of everything that was going on. And I thought that was a kind of, cool little 
reference to it while also keeping it relatively light for as dark as it was because that's where we get all of the it's the uh the five plus three walls and the uh the the double it's the double square (laughs) (laughs) you know so i i thought it was those were those were like the two big ones that stood out to me along with obviously the reference to the magic system that would eventually become like D's magic system uh oh, yeah, i should have said that yeah yeah the <laughs> magic system yeah strong D vibes yeah <laughs> <laughs> now i get that like uh especially considering the fact though that this is like based on like 80s and like seven like 60s to 80s fantasy like that's going to be a lot less pop culture than you know for those of us born in the 90s <laughs> Oh yeah, D and D absolutely was out way, well before this book. Um, uh, via strength, but I, I'm just saying that like this, this book references only from like the 80s and earlier. So, and the versions of D and D that existed then are very different from the ones that exist now. Like it's it's evolved, so it's not necessarily like, and I'm going to pick this up unless I have some knowledge of the other stuff or if you're specifically looking for it. And I spent this book specifically looking for stuff. So um, <laughs> that fits on me. <laughs> so what was, what was your favorite um, section between the four sections, the color of magic, sending of a, the lure of the worm and close to the edge. What oh. was your favorite and why? Oh, that is so tough, uh, because, like, I like elements of all of them, but, uh, it is, oh, man, that is, I did, I should have had a favorite, but I really, like, it's a tie between Center of Eight and Lure of the Worm. I, I think I have to give a slight edge to Lure of the Worm. Uh, because it has the most bizarre bullshit <laughs> that makes the most weirdly bizarre sense that I've ever seen in a book outside of maybe The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which is one of my all-time favorites. Especially the yeah. fact that they're falling through the sky and suddenly transport themselves into another like dimension where they're on an airplane of all fucking things. <laughs> and they start like devolving into this like normal like regular earth versions of themselves and then pop back into fantasy like oh what the hell is that (laughs) (laughs) you know i like the idea that imagination has its own like dimension and power i like the idea that it is limited in a certain space so it's not something you have to like think about happening throughout the entirety of the disc world and it kind of makes sense um we kind of start to see rinse wind showing why he's a main character two flowers uh, two flower has his you know epic moment of creating dragons and it's got a little bit of like everything in that one and so i think that one kind of stands out as my favorite with a slight edge over the um sender of eight how about you you know for me um i really like the first story the color of magic (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it was just so it just felt it felt so right that the the city would be overcome with greed and burn the whole damn thing <laughs> down. Uh, and like how casual Rincewind and the heroes were meeting on the hill or wherever the fuck they were. They're like, oh yeah, you know, the city burned down. Anyway, where are you guys heading, you know? <laughs> <laughs> And especially, I think my favorite part of that story was the moment in the tavern when Two Flower walked in 
and was trying to communicate with the bartender and was all like, I've got all this fucking money, but I have no idea what things cost. And the bartender's like, I'm going to make you pay out the ass for everything because you clearly have no idea. And Rincewind's like, listen, it is wrong to take advantage of people. And Two Flowers like, oh my gosh, you can help me. How about I give you a gold piece a day? And he's all like, that sounds fair. Yes, <laughs> I told, I'm on board. Let's do that. But yeah, wrong to take advantage of people for their money. Honey. <laughs> Honestly, oh, like it was... that's yeah, I I completely agree. And that's part of what makes it hard to pick a favorite out of any of these is you could make a case for just about any of these stories being individually like its own fun little adventure and having favorite and making it your favorite throughout the entire story. You know, it's harder to, I think it might be slightly harder to like the last one, but that's because it ends on a literal cliffhanger. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking cliffhangers, bro. <laughs> <laughs> like one of the most literal cliffhangers since the movie Cliffhanger. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, it was no longer a cliffhanger after the end because he let go. <laughs> Metaphorically speaking, no. um, uh, but I do agree with Drake. The last one does have some confusing parts to it because of things get a little wibbly wobbly with like how they end up places. Um, so yeah, but like all of these are still solid stories though, and there is kind of a story beat across each of the four stories though you have your call to adventure you have like in the middle parts you have the struggles against um you know the world around them and, like the forces of the entire universe you have like basically every kind of struggle in the middle two and then the last one is just <laughs> yeah the the more gods yeah. get involved the crazier it gets until the point where fate is literally like sacrifice these motherfuckers. Somebody needs to kill them. <laughs> <laughs> He's all like, I fucking hate these guys. <laughs> and all of a sudden the goddess of luck shows up and she's just like, I can give you a chance. <laughs> 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 so you're telling me. I was me not prepared for the fucking frog bit. <laughs> I, they focus too much on it. I was just like, I remember seeing that and expecting the frog to like turn into something. I thought the gag was be the was gonna be the frog was just a frog, because it never came up again in the actual section that it was a part of. And then at the yeah. very end, it pays off, and it's just like I was a goddess the whole time, <laughs> you know, which is was, another was, high uh, fantasy trope, isn't it? Yeah. That was that was pretty uh uh hit the nail right on the head when he's like they're drifting off and he sees a frog and he's like yoink puts it in his coat. What? <laughs> Fuck off, mate. It's a frog. <laughs> <laughs> Just a frog. <laughs> Don't pay attention to the frog. Ignore it. <laughs> it has no bearing on the story later. <laughs> It's just a frog. Nobody likes seeing little elbows creatures die. <laughs> You're the psycho. <laughs> <laughs> what, um, don't you pick up frogs and put them in your pocket? <laughs> I mean, there was a time, yes. <laughs> it's a lot less altruistic, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be my best friend, Cockett. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man. Let's talk about the gods. Okay, yeah. What about them would you like to discuss? So, uh, how do you, how do you think the gods um what did you think of the gods interaction with the world? I really like the fact that the gods were omniscient but not necessarily omnipotent. Uh, the fact that they like know about 
<laughs> of the dice game. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I got you. <laughs> um, I really like this idea that the gods are just like effectively these multi-dimensional beings that just happen to get settled somewhere and be like, well, I guess I control this here in this part of the multiverse. <laughs> and, uh, you know, because they literally describe like the uh, God of fate being like, I'm the God of fate of this world that only exists because there has to be an end like a far end to the improbability curve of the multiverse, <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is very Greek uh, in that, like, these gods are technically gods, and then there's the gods of beyond the gods, which would be, like, the Titans, like, um, very similar also to, like, Norse mythology is, like, you've got these, like, nine realms type of thing, but and said it's an infinite amount of realms but i like that they they play games that make sense for immortals to play right or like i also like the idea that fate's like i'm inevitable and then death is like i'm more inevitable <laughs> <laughs> you want to bet you're inevitable fuck that watch this <laughs> yeah but i like that they play these games with like souls and they're just like well uh, uh, i'll call your bluff fate that you're not as 100 percent undeniable as you say you are and fate's like are you trying to cheat me no (laughs) (laughs) but like everybody i really (laughs) i really liked the introduction to gods with death just strolling down a street because it was like one minute we're in this story, and then the next minute death is walking down the road. It's like, what the fuck is going on? What the hell is this? <laughs> I like how death was like so cordial with Rincewind. He's like, oh, death, hey, what's up? Death's like, Rincewind, top of the morning to you. So what's, what's going on? You're, you're, you're not supposed to be here. I have I have an appointment scheduled for you 500 miles from here. And he's all like, gosh, you know, I just don't think I can make it. <laughs> I just, you know, it's just so far away and the uh, time is so short. It's, can't make it. That's like, all right, fine. Well, I'll catch up to you later. You can't avoid me forever. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was it was good. It felt it felt like the gods were like actual people that just happened to have godlike powers. (laughs) I also like that, uh, that aspect of the fact that the gods, they, they are, they could be everywhere all at once if they wanted to, but they just don't (laughs) because they're like, well, that's, (laughs) That's inconvenient. You're the asshole for making me go go all over the place in time. (laughs) Because, like, if you think about it, like, if you're that vast, like, if you were everywhere all at once, uh, we get kind of a glimpse into it when they meet that ghost. Uh, The ghost of uh, the dragon, uh, the king of the dragon, of the... uh, Wurmberg or whatever is like he's like do you have any idea how annoying it is to feel simultaneously late and like like feel like something is a memory but like a distant memory but also like inevitable doom at the same time (laughs) like if you're already dealing with that having to deal with the other stuff on top of it would like it makes sense that you'd want to take a more narrow view, even if you could technically view more, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was a interesting take on the what if death doesn't claim a wizard that very clearly died. It's like, <laughs> oh, well, I guess you just hang out. It's like leaving a party and then calling your Uber, and the Uber's like. Oh, it'll be 20 minutes. And you're like, oh, well, fuck. 
what do, what do, what do I do now? <laughs> I already left. <laughs> now you're just stuck outside in the cold. <laughs> and then somebody else comes out and's like, "Hey man, I thought you left." And you're like, "Yeah, well, I fucking meant to, but you know, didn't work out that way." Uh, let's see. Shall think... we? Uh... Oh, shall we? What? I was gonna say. Shall we? Shall we start considering wrapping up? Got any uh, big hitter topics that you wanna wanna hit before we wrap? Um, I don't have any other big topic, uh, like any big hitter topics. Like, uh, I will say this for those of you that do read this book, I will. Well, I'll fold this into my final thoughts. Why don't we just do it that way? Okay. <laughs> uh, in that case, let's let's quick hit on where did this book fall short? Okay. Um, I think that it does fall short in the aspect of it is kind of confusing sometimes, and you do have to pay like a serious amount of attention. Um, considering. like how lighthearted the book is you have to pay a lot of attention to keep up with this book and luck and it just packs it's very dense in some places like it packs a lot of information into a short period of time and that can be hard to follow for people who don't necessarily understand certain concepts and it might turn some people off just by the nature of being a little confusing in that way so i think it can be a little convoluted like overly convoluted sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, for me, I think there were a couple of flow issues in the book. Um, not not anything super crazy that was like book ending flow problems, but there were definitely times where you know, Rinse, Wind, and Two Flower were were definitely booking it in the story and making moves. And there were other times where they were just kind of stagnant, waiting for things to happen. Um, we kind of already touched on the plot issue, which is there's not a lot of plot. Uh, but I honestly... V.S. VS Drake at the beginning kind of really hit home with it. it's like i didn't realize it at the time but i really think the humor carried this book pretty well and uh i think if it weren't for that humor i would have a hard time saying that this was a good book uh so i guess plot or and or humor for me you know <laughs> makes a book um so yeah, I'd say it was really strong in world building and uh, lacked coherent flow, and it made made it hard to pay attention at at times. Seems like uh, V.S. Drake says uh, lots of attention, and it can be immature in many places, which gives the reader permission to not pay attention. Uh, lots of yeah. attention needed for the book. Yeah. Um, yeah, I definitely agree. Uh, this is definitely a book where you really, really ought to pay attention to what's going on at every moment, or you might find yourself totally lost as to how you got where you got. <laughs> but it's a fun one to reread, so because uh, there's a lot to pick up in what you would have missed. But uh, on that note, why don't we just slide right into our final thoughts then? Yeah. My my final thoughts for this novel was that uh it's a classic. <laughs> you know, it feels like Pratchett is spitting in the face of practical fantasy writing by going, "You know what? Fuck you. I'm going to do what I want." And I fucking loved it. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> it was beautiful how he was like i make my own rules and you can either like it or get the fuck out <laughs> <laughs> um, 
you know, even down to how he essentially broke one story into four unique stories, which, you know, some authors do, like Sanderson breaks each Stormlight Archive book into five parts, and they are distinct parts, but you can tell that they're a coherent story, where this is, you know, each each part of this book is its own story. And it's it's a very clear cut and dry division between the stories. And I thought it was just a really well done example of how to do parts for a novel. And um, obviously, I would recommend a, a read here because it was hilarious and it throws throws out the common denominator of fantasy storytelling and <laughs> makes its own way. I truly love that description because I basically have to agree on all counts. Uh, I think this is a book that despite the fact that you need to pay attention to it, it is short enough that I think anybody could give the amount of attention that this needs. Um, I think a lot of people are going to get, I think there's a certain segment of people that are going to get turned off by how convoluted it can get. But if you can just kind of let your, let that part of it go, I think anybody could find the humor in this enjoyable that enjoys fantasy in any respect. I think anybody can enjoy like the universal gags, even if you don't pick up on the more subtle Easter eggs and references and like you said, there is a good flow to the individual stories as well as the stories throughout as a more cohesive overall story. And I would absolutely recommend this to most people, uh, especially if you are a fan of like old school high fantasy. Like this is like your this is your hitchhiker's guide, you know as Hitchhiker's Guide is to all things sci-fi, this is to all things like 80s and earlier fantasy. It hits a lot of great notes, uh, but it is entirely its own and separate from Hitchhiker's. It has its own sense of humor. It has its own way of going about things. Like you said, it pulls no punches and the fact that it is just going to be its own thing. Um, (laughs) And it is a fun it's a fun read it is a lot of concentration but loved it would recommend it also for those who are the big fantasy geeks uh highly recommend reading it once on your own and then going through a second time and having the the wiki open so that you can sit you know and see how many of the references you can catch because it has a Reference by reference breakdown, page by page, where all the references are. <laughs> because this book has been around Does so really? long and fully dissected. Yeah, like page uh, 73. Possibly could I kill, uh, possibly I could kill only one of you, but I suggest you ask yourself which one is a variation on the kind of quotes Clint Eastwood makes in Dirty Harry as well as various other action films. So, like, it has literally the most random, like, references all thrown in there. So it's kind of like a fun secondary read for it, for those who are into that sort of thing, uh, like I am. And honestly, I would have had a hard time not making this into our honorable mentions for a spoiler alert for our Christmas special, um, so have I fully read this one by the time we did it? So uh, because it won't get put on next year's list, I have to say it now. Uh, but uh, you know, definitely check out our Christmas special, or if you want to see it a bit early, join our Patreon. We'll probably tell you, we'll tell you about the links later. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it looks like BS Strength love this book. But, uh, and it definitely has an audience, and they would recommend this book to people who like comedy and are open to a book that doesn't take itself seriously. The people that read this will need to be open to that immaturity. Yeah, there is some definite immaturity in it, but I think there's an element of that in 
like any com like if you like comedy books, you'll you have to like at least a little immaturity. <laughs> I mean, that's like the heart of comedy, right? <laughs> <laughs> Many kinds. For sure. And a uh, spe special note to the audiobook for The Color of Magic is fantastic. Yes, <laughs> it is. <laughs> uh, it definitely lends to the comedy of the book. Uh, it's narrated by uh, Colin Morgan, Peter... Uh, I have no idea how to say his name. Sarah... Sarah fin, fin, Finaux, I'm going to go, or yeah, Peter Sarah Finaux is what I'm, final answer, and Bill Nye, not the science guy, but the, the narrator, <laughs> Bill Nye. <laughs> I think you guys had a different they do, audio. They do a book. fantastic job. I think you guys had a different oh, audio really? than I did, because mine was uh, done by one guy <laughs> the entire time. Yeah, there's a there's a few variations out there. I think Terry Pratchett actually reads uh, the book for one audiobook. Uh, if if you're interested in getting his take on how things should be said and all that, but well, yeah, yeah that was the actually one with one the three narrators. I was, I was a huge fan of. <laughs> yeah, that was actually one thing that I think was worth uh, the audio uh, reading the audiobook for. Is there's some weird names in this book. And having somebody else pronounce them is kind of nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, let's uh, let's do do the uh, clerical duties here real quick. Um, where's my mouse? There it is. Okay. Uh, next next up, books. We'll we'll hit that real quick, and then we'll talk future themes. Uh, we'll talk side pieces. Uh, We'll just do the plug now. DMstable.com if you want any more info about anything. There we go. We got the plug out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Patreon.com slash DMstable if you want to get in on the Christmas special. Yeah, that that thing. Yeah. <laughs> our, our January book is actually going to be done in February due to some scheduling conflicts. It's that time of year where schedules are just jam-packed. Uh, so February 3rd. We're doing Lord of the Flies, uh, classic, classic novel there. So don't don't uh, don't miss out on our February third Lord of the Flies episode. After that, we'll be doing A Touch of Darkness by Scarlett Saint Clair. That's on February seventeenth. So don't da, da, don't dilly dally. <laughs> it's only a couple of weeks between Lord of the Flies and A Touch of Darkness. Uh, I think all of these books were suggested uh, by people we know. So thank you. Um, thank you to those that we knows for those we'll, suggestions. We'll be sure to give you a um, shout out when we do the actual books. <laughs> yes, uh, this was this was this one was suggested by Alexis. So Alexis, thank you for the suggestion for a touch of darkness. And uh, also, thank you to my friend Cassie, who uh, is the one who recommended The Color of Magic. Uh, coming up in March, we are going full KFC. That's right. Original recipe, baby. So. <laughs> <laughs> so confused when you said that earlier. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, so DM's table just wants to remind our viewers that uh, Touch of Darkness is a hot and steamy book, so uh, maybe, you know, don't read it in public, but uh, be <laughs> forewarned. <laughs> All right, yep, it gets a little saucy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but March, we'll have a vote up for you sh um, shortly, and that will just be our usual anything that fits in the 800s, so it could be anything for anyone. <laughs> snap <laughs> uh, and then I think that's all we have lined up for right now we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves and we're still looking into what we're going to be doing going forward but we are looking forward to all of it so keep up with the uh, keep up with us for updates and uh, once again 
Uh, we have our Christmas special coming out just before the holidays, and it will be available to everybody else uh, after New Year's. So if you're impatient and you want to tell us what to do, <laughs> <laughs> join our Patreon. Patreon. Two dollars. That's all you it know. takes. Yep. You get to find out what books we loved, what books we hated, and maybe some secret special stuff that we talk about. I don't know. All right. So, very quick, brief side piece action. Adam. Yeah. I uh, I finished The Sunlit Man, uh, the secret novel number four from Brando Sando. Uh, it was good. I'll leave it at that. I started... Uh, I started on Starsight, or sorry, Skyward. I finished Skyward. I started on Starsight, which is uh, book two of Skyward. But um, mm-hmm. trying to trying to trying to trying to get get through the um, Skyward series because uh, what was it called? Defiant just came out. It's a Brando Sando series. Yeah, I know. I'm obsessed with Brando Sando novels, but <laughs> gotta catch up, man. Can't can't get falling behind on the Brando Sando novels. <laughs> <laughs> or you'll never catch up. Um, <laughs> get close. <laughs> <laughs> DS Drake said they uh, finished up Superpowers Year Four. Very long, but very worth it book. That was. Uh, you may or may not see mentions of it in our holiday special. Uh, yeah. My personal uh, uh, side pieces were the uh, Dungeon Master's Guide and the Player's Handbook. I'm gearing up to do one of my <laughs> first uh, ever DM experiences. So uh, very helpful books, worth it. If you want to get into D&D, even if you are never going to DM, there are very useful tidbits for story writing um and build uh building narratives and some just a cool general nerdy shit in both of them so <laughs> uh for those of you who are interested worth it all right i, I think that is it for us uh we're going to be off for quite a while because you know the holidays uh, we hope you enjoy yours whatever they may be or if they have just ended for those of our jewish viewers <laughs> Or, yeah. <laughs> no. So thank you everybody for joining us, and we'll uh, see you next book.